Good evening, and welcome to the Laughing Monkey Music Show. Terry and John Karabi, how are you? I'm all right, buddy. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. We finally get to talk. Um, you're going to promote your, obviously, your book. You've a your book out, and you've been doing the rounds, and I'm sure you're... <laughs> you said a no, lot. You know. yeah, it's, it's, it, I'm used to it now. I've been doing this quite a while. And, you know, like anytime you release new music or you lead a new record or a book or a movie or whatever, it's just like, OK, here it is. Here comes here comes the press junket. So. It's hard. And, and then now you have a new generation of people because the podcasting world, it, I actually have a podcast itself, but the YouTube version of it, whether it's podcasting or not, is a new world of some are professional, some are unprofessional, some are radio stations, some are just, you know what I mean? It's, you have a weird mix of people coming in, different questions. It's a whole new new ball game for musicians now, you know? Yeah, it's 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 taken me a minute to figure out. I, I You know, I got to be honest with you, I'm not a techie kind of guy, do you know what I mean? So, like, I'm just now catching up with the, you know, the whole YouTube and Instagram and Facebook, and everybody's, like, telling me, like, you know, ways that I can tag my songs so that yep. they we reaches a wider. And I'm like, man, I, you know, Jesus, you're like what, what happened in the good old days of just putting a song out and having the music do the talking. Well, you I know, know, and the YouTube channels is, is more important now as a way to talk out. A lot more artists are doing that now going on, have their own YouTube channel, which I encourage every artist to do. I think you should, you know, work on yours and do, you know, it's a great, it's a great uh, medium. It's really easy for you. Yeah. Well, I'm figuring it out slowly but surely. Let's Moving talk about forward. the book, though. This is pretty exciting. I mean, I know in the junk you've talked about, you, you you started writing it a while back, but it wasn't in your own words, which I think is important because, I mean, how many life stories are you going to write out there? And once it's out there, it's out there, you know. It, well, it, it's a thing like, <clears throat> um, you know, I, I just – the I, 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 I've done it a few times, and, you know, I, I – you know, I would get things back and there'd be like, you know, misspelled words and, you know, that, that, that. And, and then I did another version with a book, and, you know, of the book. And it was, you know, this guy was really cool, very intelligent, but he actually wrote intelligent. Oh. And I'm like, dude, there is nothing intelligent about me at all. So oh. uh, I kind of put it to bed for a while. And then I saw Paul, the guy that co-wrote the book with me. Yep. And he's a bit of a, like a motley historian. Hit me from a different angle and said, you know, Crab, there's a lot of people that read your chapters in the dirt and they thought they were great chapters. They were honest. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and he said, a lot of people out there that would like to know more about you. And he, he pointed out, he said, you know, you've always been this guy that comes out, like, like we were just saying earlier, right. every time you have new music or a new thing out, he goes, you hit everything really hard and then you disappear. And he goes, so, you know, you're like, nobody really knows anything about right. you. So I, I relented. I said, okay, let's do it. And, um, it, I wouldn't have been able to do it without Paul. He was really a stickler for like research and times and dates and places and um, really helped refresh my memory in, in most cases. But, um, I guess the big thing was, you know, it had to sound like I was telling the story. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, we, we even, I, I, I can't say we butted heads because we didn't, but it was, it was even weird. Like he's Australian. So his terminology and his phrasing would be a little different than what I was using as well. Right. Like a different vernacular. Yeah, like he, like, you know, we say, um, you know, while I was waiting, mm -hmm. while I was waiting, that's kind of an American thing. Right. You know, he's Australian, so he says, whilst. <laughs> and I'm, yeah, dude, we got to, you know. Out. Yeah, so it was like, he put it together, sent it to me, I edited it, I took things out. I added things, then I sent it back to him. He did the same thing, he sent it back to me. We did this eight or ten times. And I think we got it pretty, where it's pretty awesome. 
You know I what liked I mean? It. it felt very real. It felt like you were talking. Um, I don't think I caught any spelling errors. That makes me crazy when I read a book. I'm like, doesn't somebody proofread? <laughs> yeah, I don't think there's any errors or anything. I think the book came out really, it was really good. I got it as a Kindle. I didn't realize you had all these signings and stuff. I was like, oh, it's because I wanted to read it early. And the thing like that I didn't understand about, you know, one of the guys that I I, I try, attempted to do a book with, um, like it, it was, there was so many misspelled words. And, and like, even when we did it, we sent it back and forth as a word document. Mm-hmm. Even me, like, I would type something in and, and it, it, you know, the word document on its own would underline the word and go, hmm, questionable, might want to check the spelling. And it's like, so I, did, I, did, I don't understand how you can have misspelled words in a book. Because if you do a word document, it pretty much corrects itself, just right. like your do you know I mean, what I mean? There's a mistake in the printing. And that's what I'm saying. I, I, I'm not a speller. And thank God for spell check and everything else. It's allowed me to go other parts of my life because I'm not spelling. So if I'm catching spelling mistakes, it's not a good sign. Yeah. You know? and, and just, you know, overall grammar and different things like that. So I'm really happy with it. I think Paul Miles did a, a great job. Um, I think the publishing company did a great job. They even said, like, it's a, it's a bit... Uh, I think they said even like a normal musical biography, autobiography Mm -hmm. is generally around 350 pages. And I exceeded that by like 160 pages. But they even said they were going to, should we edit it? And everybody at the company read it and said, no, it was an easy read. It goes by quick. Um, you know, so they left it as is. I mean, they pretty much left the book as Paul and I wrote it. You know what I mean? And then even because I did do an audio book. Yep. <clears throat> so even as I was reading it, I I was like I was catching little things along the way, and then I would change it in the, you know, on the. Uh, transcript that would change it and we would word it and then i would i would redo it again and you know narrate it properly right so up to even up to the audiobook thing we were making changes and and um fixing things so it was pretty cool well that's important i think it's important to tell people too because it's not just a rock book because there's a lot of good stories and i think there's a lot of good chapters and there's other you have, there's a big arc to a story i mean you actually have a good arc in your story too it's not just like your biography and you have you know you talk about you know the relation to the uncle jack song and different parts you've grown up and, and you have some really crazy stories so there's a lot in there for other people even if you're not a fan of music per se you could become a fan you could reverse engineer your way into this by reading your book i think it'd be a good book for anyone who's even not a musician that's and the important part of that is it the way it's written is it's very um it's open for people it is it is an easy read as in it's a comfortable read. Like you start reading it, you're not struggling. You're not, you're like, you understand it. It's very much at everyone's level, you know? I, that's, I, that's what makes it great. I, I hate when I read books and I have to read the book with a dictionary next to me. Yep. I, you know what I mean? I just want, that's why I said it's got to be, I can get my point across. It's just got to sound like me. I'm well, just, you, you, you know. A lot of big words make you sound like a jerk too. Though, if you just put them in there, just put them in there too. It's like, like that—that's not me. I'm just some jerk from a little, you know, inner city urban part of Philadelphia. You know, what you see is what you get. So, I, well, I think everybody did a great job. Yeah. So I'm encouraged people to check it out. I just want to say to you know, as far as reading, it's really good. I read a lot of rock books, so and a lot of other books. So to me. That's an important part of the book. It was really good, actually. So but inside of it, though, I learned a lot that I didn't know. And like I said, there was a lot that people didn't know about you. Um, and surprising. You, growing up, you are you were a little hooligan. And, um, you know, I was surprised to, to hear some of the, how rough the streets were for you and how, how rough your, you know, your background was. That was kind of a... It, you know, <clears throat> the neighborhoods that I grew up in weren't easy neighborhoods. They were very much like... Um, um, do you ever see like, um, like Southie in, in Boston? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So it was very, that kind of a neighborhood, like a very Irish Catholic, most of the neighborhoods I grew in. 
grew up in were an Irish Catholic, um, take no prisoners, <laughs> like, you know, uh, so it was very much like, I, I mean, I had ca characters in my life that I was growing up with that could have been, you know, um, one like of the those, Scorsese movie. I was thinking like the background of one of the Scorsese movies. Those yeah, like, that like grown up. Part, yeah, like I, that's what I think of, like The Departed, and you know some of those guys in that, uh, you know Johnny Depp when he did Whitey Bulger and yes, you know Goodwill Hunting, you know those those guys, um, you know, and it's like all the kids that I grew up with were like characters in that movie, all those movies. So it was, uh, it was interesting. It was kind of, it was definitely, let's just leave it at that. <laughs> what was crazy is it is almost like it's just like a chapter with the story of um, the one neighbor that you were harassing. It turns out he was being, abusing his family and we killed one of his um, kids. And that is an insane story. Yeah, he like, was, uh, he, he's actually, he was actually, and, and I didn't realize this until we started doing the book. Um, Paul researched it and I told him about this story about this guy Callinger who wound up being a serial killer. I, I, I was going to look it up. I haven't yet to do it because I, I just finished the book. I was like, oh, I got to look up this background now because it sounds insane. Well, when I was telling Paul the story, he looked it up on Google and he was like, holy shit, dude. Like, seriously, this guy was nuts. And I go, yeah, dude, he was, he was like my neighbor. Like, literally lived behind my house and behind, like on the street behind my house <laughs> and like right on the corner, which was like maybe four, you know, East coast row homes away. And I hung out with his sons and, um, and, and it was weird. So when he was doing the research on the guy, he started yeah. looking it up. And found out that somebody had written a book about him, like the same lady or some like that wrote the book Sybil. Okay, yep. Wrote a book on Joseph Callinger and it's called The Shoemaker. Um wow. which I'm gonna it, check it out. About it. I'm actually I actually wanna I, I, I wanna get that that book. But um yeah I wound up getting into a fight with his son and we beat the shit out of each other. And then when he was going home I was like, you know, that like little inner city. Yeah. If you come back in my neighborhood again. <laughs> you know, right. I'll, I, and I'm so I go, I'll fucking kill you. Well, then, then the kid winds up dead. Like <laughs> they find his body like a month or so later. I'm like 14, 15 years old. Cops come to my house. They take me to the precinct and they sit there and interrogate me for 11 hours, 12 hours. Do you know what I mean? And they're showing me photos of his body. And I'm like, oh, dude, seriously. So I was in all this shit for a minute. And then they figured out that the father was a serial killer. He got caught for that. And then when he got caught for that, the place where he took his son's body, they realized that he had killed his own son for insurance money. That's insane. It, Weird story, dude. It's crazy, and and the people we're not. It's not even taking away from the story in the chapter either. People, you just got to check it out. It's it's written well. And what's great is because you come into the story. And I like the way Paul wrote it. Like it's like you and you're reading it. Like man, you were, you guys are, you, you know kind of being kids. And you're 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 you know being bad and you're harassing this guy and the little guy's kind of a jerk. But you and then you, just, you get to the meat of it. Also, the story just flips over. You're like, oh my god. Like <laughs> it just goes from just kids harassing and fighting to like this this nightmare of like Jeffrey Dahmer's your neighbor, which is insane. Yeah, it was. Um... Yeah, it was, it was definitely, and I remember, I mean, that was 1974, 75, wow. you know, and it's like, you know, that shit back then, it was like, you know, didn't, like, you didn't really hear about it that that much, you know, and all the police are in the neighborhood. They finally called my mom and told her that I was off the hook, um, and they wound up arresting this guy, and, you know, they found out he had you know, he'd been, and, and it, it was just such a twisted story that he had tortured his own kids, but he took his, like, his youngest son out on these crime sprees with him, and he would, he would case homes and watch a husband leave and go to work, and then he would go in posing as, like, a 
door-to-door salesman or the electric company. And he would go in and he would, he would find these women, you know, that were home alone. Right. He tie them up, rob them. And then he, at knife point, he'd have his son, his like 13, 14 year old son, rape them. And he'd watch. And, and then, you know, some cases he, you know, he'd kill the girl or, you know, whatever. And that then is, they, that is insane. Yeah, it you, you got to look it up. It's it's a oh. it was a nightmare. It was crazy, and I I got in trouble because they thought I killed his son, and I'm. <laughs> That's a good plot twist. Yeah, it was uh, it was very interesting. And, and you know, and, and the book continues on with stories like that and fun stories, not all bad, but that you know that's early in the book, so you know when people read it, you get a big a lot of turns, a lot of twists and turns that you don't expect, you know. Of course, as you go on, you, you talk about, you know, you're, you're, you're singing and playing guitar and, and getting into bands. Scream, and then, you know, was well spoken about how you got in Motley Crue and the whole turnaround. Everyone's been following that, I think. Um, I always thought it was weird because I was, like everyone else, you know, loved the 94 album. It was, you know, it was great. I think it was a good time for them. I don't understand why. I think the record company did drop it because that was a time when Pantera was out and everything was heavy. That really could have kept you really got to sound more relevant than anything than not having Vince in the band at that time, you know. Um, so that was that was a crazy that the labels didn't push that because the uh, guys again, crossed you know, that bridge. It was a bridge though that you, you tied them together. I, I I again there was you know well, I could sit here and I could go back and I could look at that time frame and probably give you a hundred reasons why that record didn't work. You know, but it was just like, again, this is where the name came from. Because I like be doing the editing process of this book and telling all these stories. I kind of realized that I'm the king of being at the right place, but always at the wrong time. If right. Look I, at, I... Even, even the records that I've had, the girls that I've dated, been married to, you always go into it with high expectations. Like, oh, this is the one, this is the one, this is the one. And then shit happens, and it and it kind of goes in a different different direction. But it's weird. Like even if even the bands that I've been in, it's like the Scream. Everybody talks about that record now. Like, oh my god, what a great album! It's like this cult classic. And then they go the Motley record, you know. And you have some fans that go best record they did. Some fans are like, oh my god, I hated it. But it's like this cult classic. Same right. with Union. It's it's just. You know, it's just funny, man. It's just, I'm just, I've just been that guy my whole career, you know, and, and it's, it's kind of funny. That's, that's why we call the book Horseshoes and Hand Grenades. But it is, I mean, it was a weird time for music to begin with. A lot of bands just flopped anyhow. Looking back now, you can really look back and see every band was trying to be a look, trying to do a limit. Band was kind of changing. It was, it was going to happen anyhow on some level, most bands, but you know, you did take a lot of heat for it. I, I like the fact, you know, I, I dug you in that when that came out. I was like, "This is a solid album." It was, you know, it was always been in my playlist. But then, I wasn't too aware of um, the um, early screams. I went and listened to Scream, and then I moved forward. And I loved Union. And I was actually just listening today to um, the Robin song. I'm gonna tell you, that song to me is. Um, I'm sorry, that song is very much like if you read the lyrics, it can almost sound bitter. But if you listen to the melody, it makes a total love song. Like the lyrics kind of can, can, can flip around. I, you know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. You, you know, it's weird. I wrote that song um, right after I split up with that girl. And honestly, I wrote her a letter. And, um, you know, I was just kind of bummed out, whatever. Just all this crazy right. shit was happening. Um, you know, it was like my son was diagnosed with diabetes. My mom had passed away. The girl that I'm living with, she bails. I had zero money, like all the shit. I, I, and like, you know, we had been separated for a minute. And I just, I don't even know why I wanted. So I wrote her the letter. But then I said, you know what? I'm not going to mail it. Let me sit on it for a day or two. <laughs> and it sat on my it's, I had a coffee table and it sat on my coffee table for months. Yeah. I never sent it. 
And then I had the music, had the melody, and um, when we were doing the Union record, everybody wanted to do Robin's song because they heard the melody and they, they loved yeah. the music. They were like, oh, great. Dude, you need to write lyrics. So I went home and I was like pulling my hair out, trying to figure out, okay, what am I going to write about? And I literally just happened to look down um, the girl's name was Robin. Right. And I wrote a letter and it was like, Dear Robin, I wish there was something I could say that could make you change your mind. And I sat there and I went, Oh, that's, that's a great line. Is there something you can say to make you change your mind? So I started with that. And then the song just kind of started writing itself. And every time I got into a little pinch, I'd just look at the letter and I would take another sentence out of there and tweak it and make it fit with the song. So that's why I call it Robin Song. That was her name. And I just literally wrote it off of the letter and I put it on the record and, you know, and everybody, you know, it, and, and that's the one song like everybody's got their. If you go back and you look at your love life and your dating. Right. Everybody's got. The Robin. Life. You know what I mean? Yeah. The chick that you. The chick that just, you know, for whatever her reasons were, just said, this isn't going to work. And, right. and, and love was wrong. That was the best line, too. Yeah. You know, and it's, not that it's not, not that it's wrong. It's just wasn't right for that time. Well, that, but lyrically, that, it fit perfectly. The song, too, it's got to fit. <laughs> yeah. So it was literally just based on the letter that I wrote her and I never sent her. So it worked out. It's a great song, and I get a ton of emails. I, I was really surprised because I thought it would be more of a girl song. Really? But it's weird, dude. Like, I have so many guys that come up to me and go, dude, play Robin's song. You have no yeah. idea. When my wife, like, four years ago, and I played that song every day. And I was like, holy shit. Like, wow. Okay, I didn't see that coming. But, um I still get a ton of emails about that song. That's so, awesome. I know. I'm, I'm, be therapy for somebody. <laughs> when I heard it, I heard you know, the Union album. I loved it. And, you know, love it. I don't need it anymore. And then I heard Robin's song. I was like, oh my god, there's something that stood out so much more because I think it is. It's, yeah, like you're right. It's very real, relatable. Everyone's got the Robin story, so it's not just personally more. Once you put it out there in ethos, you know, everyone's owned that song now, and it means a lot. You know, and it's so simple, and that's the hard yeah. part. Is writing a simple song. That everybody and it, touches everybody. That's the Beatles, you know. Taking, um, you know, just things that people were, you know, I, like you've, you know, if you've had your heart broken, you know what I'm talking about. Like, you got your friends that try to give you advice, and you know, um, you know. So it's like the first, the first sentence was something that was in the letter, and then I think the second verse is something like uh, people say that I, you know. Uh, you know, and they just give you, and I was just taking everything that I was reading and people were saying to me and I just threw it into the song and it worked. And again, it's one of the songs in my entire catalog that people seem to gravitate towards. It's weird. I'd love to see you put it out again or do something with it again. Though I think, I think a lot of fans would like to see it again. Well, yeah. I, I usually play it in my acoustic sets. Um, but I don't know. You never know, you know, uh, but we'll see. But I, I love that song. It's just it was very simple, direct to the point, And it's honest. Well, I think all your lyrics, that's one thing about you. You, you, you have a, a power chords and you have a really strong, raspy voice. But your lyrics are very open and very open. Very, you know, so it's, it's very relatable for everybody. You're not being too tough. You're actually showing your sensitive side on a lot of things. You know, which people like, you know, and I think that's why you have you start out almost like a cult following. You know what I mean? With your fans and your albums, you know, I think you've hit your final stage where everyone kind of gets you finally and enough. You have enough out there where the general public is finally going, oh, oh, this guy, this band, <laughs> my crew. Oh, that Daisy, like finally people are catching up, you know, than just the, the, the diehards. From your mouth to God's ears. <laughs> Yeah. I, you know, because I remember when he came out, I'm like, John Crabbe, like, who? And I'm like, just check it out, check it out, let's do it with Motley Crabbe, check this out, you know, then the Union, check our Union, you know, check out this, you know, 
but it was like who like you know i'm, I'm glad we got past this the motley crew reference because i always feel like that that like the one hit wonder thing like you had this one thing like you're like a one trick pony it's like no check this out i mean this is what they sound like before after camera one camera two camera one camera two and then with bruce and then you know what i mean and you don't just jump in all these bands to fill in you know i was excited that you actually went and did um the brides for that first album at that it was the clown studios there yeah at first i know it where didn't work you, out hmm? where are you located at connecticut okay um yeah clown was great i mean i i had been friends with um steve steve o, bruno the guy yeah. that owned it. and um I can't remember if I suggested us rehearsing there or not, but um, we wound up rehearsing there for quite a while and did the whole first record in Steve's place. So it was a lot of fun. Um, you know, I was kind of going through some personal things with my second divorce and, you know, all this other kind of shit. And I just took a little bit of a, I kind of tapped out. I'm like, I'm, I, I'm not I'm not right for this. I did the record. I helped write a couple songs, and then I just kind of tapped out and said, "I'm out. I can't do it." Um, I I know I probably shoot myself in the foot I don't, a lot. I, don't. I didn't get the second album. It wasn't as good. <laughs> well, it, and again for me, um, I thought the first I again not to sound weird, but I wasn't totally sold on the direction of the first record. Right. Because I, I, I like, I, I really didn't know what we were doing again. Now, part of that could have been me. My headspace was, I was in a completely weird thing. I was going through a divorce, just, you know, a ton of stuff. So I just opted to, bail out and not be the anchor, you know, on someone that's swimming out of the Gulf. Um, But that's what I mean about shooting myself in the foot, because if I'm not happy with what I'm hearing or I'm not, uh, if I, I can't participate fully in something, Mm -hmm. uh, I'll walk away from it. I did it with rat. Even when rat got their record deal, um, to do the, I guess it was infestation record. I was in the band and I was just sitting there like it I had nothing to do with the guys because I liked them individually. But when you put them in a room together, they're so volatile. I just went, you know, being in a room with these guys, you know, not even at home. It's not like you can just get up, like leave rehearsal right. and go. You're trapped. Your- I'm trapped in a place like in North Carolina or South Carolina, wherever they recorded. I'm trapped here. And these guys can't get through a rehearsal without wanting to kill each other. And the idea of doing a record with just a bunch of people that were, I know we're going to argue seemed ludicrous to me. So I'm like, you know what? I don't need to do this. I'm out. Well, um, this is and smart. I, I've done that, you know, multiple times in my career. And it's just, you know, I'm not hard to get along with. I just, but I just, I also don't like drama and I don't want to fight and bicker and argue with people. So I'm just a guy like once I see that start happening, I'm like, um, I'm out. I, this I mean, look, look, there's, there's healthy, there's healthy arguments and fights. And then there's unhealthy arguments and fights. And I'm, I'm, I'm game for a good, healthy debate and, and argument as well. But not when, not once, not when it starts getting toxic. And I'm like, I got to get out of here. I'm not going to do it. So I know a lot of people ask me why I've been in so many bands, but that's kind of part of the problem. You just go because I can't give a job. What's wrong? You know? <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> a job jumper. No, it's about being happy. I mean, that's what it comes. I, and it's funny because I think when it comes to, <laughs> and talk to Steve, I think the dynamic of Rat is really it is one person who's really the strongest. It's like we all have that one person in our life that no matter 
who you are as your person. Once you're around that one person, it makes you somebody different. Like you don't know why, like it drives that person out of you. And I think there's a person or so in that band <laughs> that does it to the other members and it just changes everybody. And it's probably better you left. It's, you know, your sanity and is as, worth it. As, as it turned out, as it turned out, um, certain members in that camp called me probably twice a week <laughs> and they were like, oh my God, dude, you made the right decision. And then they went on tour and they imploded. Yep. So it, it's, you know, I, sometimes I go through life with blinders on and there's other times where I'm absolutely sure that I don't want to do something and I just, I just pull the trigger. So. It was interesting so, that, you know, cause you were, I'm sorry, you, you were doing, at what point did you start doing more acoustic -y on the road stuff? Kind of like your, your rock and roll vagabond thing you're doing. Um, honestly, probably around 2012 or so, 13. I mean, I've done other shit since. I've, obviously, I did the Daisies and... Right, right, right. But there was a time when you were like, and it was like a lot of YouTube, like you were up playing a lot of Unplugged and stuff. And I, I think still right, do. Right. Doing the rest, of, the rest of this year, that's all I'm doing. Um, but I, I probably started in... 2011 or 12 i did that unplugged record yep and right around the same time that i finished it um oddly enough tom Kiefer called me and asked me to go on the road with cinderella as their opening act and i wound up going out and doing i don't know 50 shows with them and um wasn't sure how it was going to go over, but it was great. And I just sat there and started looking at things like, well, this is kind of cool. Like I can literally go out by myself <laughs> with an acoustic guitar. I don't even use any pedals. No drama. No drama. Sit on a stool, tell my stories, play my songs, and go have a whiskey and then go home. I'm good. I'm good. So I did do some shows in, um, I think 2014 and 15, I had a band and I was doing the Motley, the Motley stuff. And mm -hmm. you know, we did it. We did a bunch of shit. And that's with my son is my drummer. And, um, we, w we went out and we did a bunch of shows. And then shortly after I got the dead Daisy's gig and I was in there for, three years, four years, something, three years, something like that. It was weird. I, I had talked to, um, and you, you did a, a duet, well, not a duet, but you're jamming you with, with Delana. Yes. Uh, and, um, and I didn't realize this. I didn't realize you guys dated. And I didn't know that until she told me. She, <laughs> I, yeah. I didn't know that. I was, it, it was a minute. I know. You know, we were, I was just getting out of a relationship and I was single and, you know, I, it, and it was just again wrong place right you know right place wrong time well i can but, see that you guys are both really good people I, but i'm saying i was laughing I'm like two of my favorite voices the dna together you guys could create who knows <laughs> you know vocally yes yeah, awesome <laughs> I, and and it's funny we didn't talk for a minute but i um i saw delana in um Amsterdam, I think I was over there doing uh, uh, with the Daisies, mm -hmm. and um, I invited her down, and she came. And then I went back and I did some acoustic shows, and she came again to the shows, and I met her and a bunch of her girlfriends, and um, you know, we've kind of kind of realized it was like again for both of us, it was the right place, wrong time. Right, right, right. She was very kind about it too. She's, I mean, it was, she's all, I mean, she's awesome anyhow too. So she's, she yeah, could, she's, she could talk to you, you know, I think what was funny with her is you talk about her, she talk about, she knew nothing about Motley Crue, but then she ends up, you know, doing some music with you and playing some with you and with Mick. I'm like, for somebody who doesn't know anything about Motley Crue, you sure getting to work with a bunch of guys that were in Motley Crue at one point, you know? Yeah. You know, again, I, I don't, Maybe she did. Maybe she did. I don't know. You know what I mean? I met her on, uh, oddly enough, I met her on the 
Vince Neil did a cruise called the Motley Cruise. <laughs> and I was there with Rat. Uh, it was Rat, Slaughter, Vince Neil, and Skid Row. Wow. And then Delana came with a bunch of friends from L.A. And I just happened to meet her and we hung out on the boat and we had some cocktails and we were all goofing off and, you know, whatever. And then uh, we, we like, I, I would go to L.A. I lived in Tennessee. She lived in L.A. I would go to L.A. and I would, you know, hang out with her, stay at her house. And then, um, you know, we did a few shows together, but it was very short lived. She was she was going through a bunch of shit. I was going through a bunch of shit and it just, you know, just didn't work out, but she's a great girl, yeah, yeah. super talented, amazing, amazing singer. Yeah. Um, he's, he's great. Um, you know, and it's just another, another, uh, <laughs> again, another reason to call the book horseshoes and hand grenades. Well, the other thing is it was good to see you guys are still good friends and you guys, it's, it's just great to see you like, you know, to not know that little fun fact, you know what I mean? The little nugget and seeing like, Oh, you know, to your favorite singers actually, the stars had crossed once for a brief moment, and then you know, <laughs> it was just neat to hear that. And you know, it's and you it's know, life. it's funny. I am literally friends with every girl that I ever dated or married, except my second wife. I, I really want nothing to do with her. But yeah, I'm with everybody else. I just, I, Delana and I had some space. We re looked at everything, and then we reached out to each other. We said, "Yeah, well, I was kind of an asshole. So was I." Okay, great. You know, and, um, you know, but I, we still, we still write. I like write to her every now and then. Hey, sweetie, how you doing? Hope things are well. Hey, I'm going to be in Europe in November, December. Hope to see you. That's awesome. You know? And so we're, we're totally good. That's good. I'm glad to hear that. It, was, yeah, it wasn't a dirt thing. I was just like, <laughs> dirt thing. It was just <laughs> a compliment of like, I had to play, you guys playing together sounded really good. And, you know, it was really good, a good fact. So you actually, then you did the Dead Daisies, which I was kind of surprised that you actually did it at that time because you'd been through so many bands and the crazy hectic schedules. It felt like at some point, I mean, you, like I said, you were just, <laughs> the other fun fact is you were, uh, you got a license and you were, you were driving trucks, which was another, I didn't know that either. That was kind of a neat little fact there for a year. That, that was a ways back though, way before. Right. And it, I was still in, I think I was only two or three years into Rat. And um, Warren took a year off. He he just he was like, I'm done. I don't want to, I don't want to tour. And you know, I was like, okay, cool. You know, I didn't really think about it, but I'm like, wait a minute. I I got I got child support, and you know, and but I was also again, I was in rat. I was going through my second divorce. And I just needed something to clear my head. I was actually doing I rat and the Rides of Destruction record. And um, wow. I just said, I, I kind of tapped out of both. Rat took a year off. I tapped out of Rides of Destruction. And I said, I need to just get out of town for a little bit. Couldn't figure out what I wanted to do. Uh, my first option was to go out and be a train engineer for like a freight train until I realized that you got to go to school like 10 years for that or whatever. <clears throat> and then my other fascination, even as a kid, um, and still to this day, it was trucks. So I made some phone calls. I realized that I could get a license in like three weeks. And uh, I went to a school. I passed with flying colors. I walked into a trucking company. I said, hey, I like to drive for you guys and you're like okay and they, you know off i went and i i went and i drove a truck all around america for like eight months nine months and then the rad guys called me up and said hey we're going on tour with toys and we're going to need you in la to rehearse for i go okay i literally took the truck back handed the guy the keys i said thank you it's been awesome and i went right back to work <laughs> but but i had I had a blast. I had a blast driving that truck. I just drove around America. I saw shit that I had never seen before. Um, I mean, I was in every state in the United States, like like places I never saw before. Right. Um, 
and I got to, I was by myself. That's what I, I was did, thinking. I did a lot of soul searching. I had a guitar with me in the back. So when I did pull into a truck stop or a rest area, I'd just mm -hmm. go grab a car and noodle around on something. And it was eight months of just like mental shutdown. That's what I, it is. Yeah. And you know what? I came back and I had a, a renewed vigor for getting out on the road and playing music again and, and, uh, seeing all the guys in rat. And, yeah. You I had fun. Yeah. That, that's right. But yeah. And, I thought, like, oh. where, can you, where can you go, clear your head and think and write music and still make 2,500 bucks a week <laughs> with like, with health insurance and you're, and you really, you have a boss, but there's nobody standing over your shoulder. You know what I mean? You just go do your thing. Drive. Awesome. Literally, you have one job, right? <laughs> when they say you had, one, you had one job, I had one job. I mean, and then to me, I thought, like, reading the story, all the way through that, of all the stuff that was going on, the drama, everything going on, whether you were involved, you know, brought it you or you, whatever, you were in the center of that tornado, all of a sudden you weren't for the first time in your life. And you had that silence, you know? And I thought that was a perfect thing for you to, to you know, bring up to where you are now, because... You know, it helped heal you. <laughs> yeah, and it, you know, it, it, you know, it's it's crazy. Like, um, you know, I did the daisies for three years, almost four years, and um, it was a blast. I had fun, but it was a fucking whirlwind. Their schedule is maniacal. Like, it was like boom, boom, boom. Like new record, boom, 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 tour. Boom, 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 new record, boom, 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 sure. And um, as much as I loved it, and I loved the music, I kind of said, you know what? I'm, I'm getting like, I'm 60. Like, this was a few years back. I go, I'm going to be 60 years old. Like, I, I just, I want to work hard, but I, I want to, I want to do it when I want to do it. Right. So you're in peace. Exactly. And so I just, I told the guys, I go, hey, man, thank you for the opportunity. I love you guys, but I I need to do this. I want to go see what I can do on my own. Unfortunately, I had 2019. I was busier than shit. Uh, for my, but it was weird. Like, I worked when I want to work. You know what I mean? When I yeah. wanted to work. And then there was a point, there was a point for um, my 60th birthday. Um I own like a tour bus size motorhome, and uh, I decided to take off for my 60th birthday, and I was just going to do a trip around Florida. And so I put my dogs in, in the coach, and my wife, and we went down to Tampa, and we stayed in Tampa for three, four days. Then we went to Key West, then we went to Melbourne, Florida. And visit my in-laws and then we hit Destin, Florida, and then we went home on like three weeks. And I still managed to be as productive, make the same amount of money as I did with the daisies, but I did it at my own pace. Right. When COVID hit the next year and everybody was out for two and a half years. But even at that, I was still productive because we wrote the book. Yeah. And and then I took classes. Um, I took Pro Tools classes to learn how to record myself, so I didn't have to rely on anybody. Because like COVID made me realize like how reliant I was on other people. And I'm like, uh, no, don't like it. So I took Pro Tools classes, and now all the new music I'm doing, I record myself, and then I send it to Marty Fredrickson. When I'm finished the song, I send it to him. And he tweaks it and it, like he'll change some shit, you know, whatever he adds to it, takes away, does his thing, produces it, and then I put it out. So it's, it's pretty cool. It's pretty amazing. It, it, you know, you kind of control your own destiny that way. It's funny to say two things. A, Marty Fredrickson is, is a secret weapon. He's on a lot of stuff that we don't even realize how great he is, you know. Yeah. So I want to do a shout out to him. He's, he's pretty awesome. Um, 
love that. Yeah, I hear a lot of good things about him. It's funny, even on your even on your time off, you still like to travel. I don't think you can sit still, can you? <laughs> what now? It feels like even, even for your birthday, you had to go out and travel. Like and your, your job was a, was a truck driver. Can you actually stay in the same place for a long time without not getting bored at this point? Uh, yeah, maybe. I don't know. I, <laughs> it's weird. I, now that you think about it, I went from Philadelphia to L.A., L.A. to Nashville. In between L.A. to Nashville, I was in Minnesota for a minute. Um, went to Nashville. Now I'm in right outside of Tampa, Florida. Um, and I go back and forth, right. you know, but it's, uh, yeah, maybe there's a, there's a bit of a gypsy in me yeah. a little bit. I never, I never put two and two together until you just said that. Read your book. I was getting exhausted. I'm like, he's kind of settled down between that and the dead daisy schedule at the end. I'm like, when's he going to quit? This is exhausting. Like, <laughs> Because I was doing emotionally involved in this story at that point. I was like, I couldn't believe you made it for three years. And I'm like, all this touring, I'm like, how's he not getting tired at this point? You know? And and that was the thing. Like, um, you know, it's really hard for people. It's really hard, even for some of the guys in your own band sometimes, to realize how much of a strain mentally and physically singing is for a singer. Because... I mean, you can do the exact same thing every day, exactly the same, eat the same amount of food, have the same amount of tea, yep. you can bait shit out of yourself, and you can walk on stage one day and sing like a bird and the exact do the exact same thing the next day and open your mouth and it's a struggle. And, you know, again, as much as I love the daisies, there just wasn't... Uh, it was just the schedule was just so hard to keep up with that I went, you know what? I, I think um, I think I need to just step away from this for a minute, focus on anything and everything John Karabi. And, um, and the other thing is too, like even from a creative point of view, like you, we were talking earlier about the yeah. song Cotabella, yeah. you're so beautiful. That was the song that I suggested to the Daisies. And they were like, no, nah, they passed on it. It's crazy. So, I'm like a PR machine behind them. That would have been a huge hit. I, I just was like, you know what? I'm going to, I, I need to, I just need to ex expand and, and just try different things, whatever. So I, I love the Daisies. We're still in contact with each other. I've been, Texting Glenn the last couple of days, make sure he feels better. He's right, got yeah, COVID, COVID, right? Yep. Yeah. So I'm like, you know, I'm 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 all good with those guys. I just I'm just I've got things I want to do and I'm figuring it out as I go. And that's another thing. When you're in a band, you kind of have to cater, you yeah. know, you and you may go in with a clear vision for a song. But then somebody else in the band doesn't see it that way. And if you get outvoted, then you're the one that's got to change your thing. And now it's like, I don't have to do that. That'd be hard. Well, yeah, you need to be the captain of your own ship. You are a brand, whether you intended to be one or not. And I think your brand's been out there in those spots where people are it's relevant enough where you can just be you and, and head off your own brand at this point. You know, Do all your own music, control all of your own stuff. You've seen now well, the independence. You make more money doing your own stuff than you do even on, the, on days with record labels. Even the song I said, Casi Bella, like when I did that, my two of my favorite songs ever is Penny Lane and Killer Queen by Queen. Not that that song sounds like either one of those, but it's got that vibe. Got you know, the it's, it's, like, it's like a fun 70s. It feels good. Yeah. It makes you happy. You feel like you feel like this warm sun coming in on a good Sunday. It just feels like a, a good moment. And it's so that upbeat. And I played it for, I played it for, you know, the daisies and um, even even some of the people now, like I played it for my manager and, you know, nobody got it. They were like, oh, I don't I don't know where you're going with this. Like, I, oh, I'm not. Well, it, in their defense, it was just me on an acoustic guitar playing it. And so I was like, OK, so once I learned how to do the Pro Tools, I literally put the song the piano, I did the drums, a bass, I laid it out. I had my friends come over. We did the backing vocals. I did the lead vocals. I did the guitars. 
and I put it all together and I sent it to Marty and everybody went, Oh, okay. Now I understand what you're trying to do here. Um, you know, so sometimes, sometimes you're the only one that hears the voices in your head. <laughs> oh, I know. Your track record though shows you kind of know you're talking about for songs though. So what about that video? Who, who did that? What's the story behind that? And who's in it? It gotta be people, you know, and friends are, I mean, there's just a bunch of friends in Nashville. Um, and um, the girl in the video and the girl in the ad for the song, uh, we kind of just, it was it was such a fluke thing. A friend of mine has a clothing company called Rock and Boho Clothing, mm-hmm. online clothing store. And I was like, oh, I, you know, I, I, I want a girl, but I don't want like a supermodel kind of girl. Right. I just want to crack a real, a real woman. Exactly. Oh, you got to see this friend of mine. And she brought this girl over and we walked in like, okay, I'm not trying to be weird, but has anybody ever told you you look like kind of resemble Kate Hudson? Okay. That's exactly what I was feeling that. And she's like, oh yeah, you know, blah, 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 whatever. So she did the video. And then when I realized I needed a cover for the thing, I saw, okay. I saw her for almost famous. I hadn't seen it in a long time and I looked at it and I went, so I called the girl, uh, I called her up and my friend, uh, Michelle, um, I said, Michelle, can you do me a favor? Can you get Jenna to come over, put some round stone glasses on her and just take a photo. And I sent her a picture of almost famous. She goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, we took her photo with the round glasses on, and then I had a friend of mine superimpose the words instead of almost famous. Right. I put Cosi Bella in, and we just tweaked it. And, um, you know, so it was just, it was it was a fun little spoofy thing to do. But it's, a you know, it, that was about a 70s band. I thought this had a very 70s vibe. Totally, totally. And the girl kind of looks like Kate Hudson. So I'm like, fuck it, let's just run with it. Let's just have fun. Okay. Well, thank you. Because I saw the, the cover. I knew that was a play on that, you know. But then when I saw the video, I was like, wow, is it really this the tie? It really felt very similar. Because I'm like, is it just me who, sings, who sees that? Because I saw that too. She reminded me of her. But I just saw the cover and then saw the video. I was like, oh, wow. So I'm yeah. glad I wasn't totally off of that assumption. It was a total fluke. Um, my friend Michelle, again, who owns Rock and Boho Clothing, she just said, um, oh, you're going to meet this girl, Jenna. She, you know, she's got this cool kind of hippie vibe. I go, okay, great. And she walked in the door and I, I kind of looked at her like, holy shit. Well, oh, Michelle, I go, this girl looks like Kate Hudson. So I go, Austin. So I asked her if she would do the video and she said, yep, sure. And, uh, at the end, she gets on a motorcycle with this guy. That was her boyfriend. He lent yeah. us the motorcycle. And I just got a bunch of my friends together at Michelle, the girl that owns the clothing company. Yep. That was their house with the pool. And we just had a backyard party. And we filmed everything on our iPhones. Really? Even the stage stuff? Yep. It's all done with It's Good done job. with two 12s. Good job. They did it together. It, was, it came out great. It did. I liked it a lot. Yeah. So I'm hoping that's your, that's obviously that's the model now for you, for songs and singles. How are we going to do this now, moving forward? Now that you are your own person and your own, you are your own leader now. I'm trying, you know, we'll see. Are we going to look, yeah. look at doing singles now? Or, I mean, you must have like a, an army of songs already together over your life. Are you writing totally, new stuff? You know, like Marty's do that are already done. I've got a few here that are already done that I've got to, there's certain things I got to tweak, some lyrics and more other parts, and then I'll send Marty the files. But I've probably got four or five more here. Um, Marty's probably got three, four, or five more there, and then I've got on this phone that I'm talking to you on. There's probably, you know, in your memo yep. down, I probably got I don't know, 35 ideas on here, just rip different things that uh, I've got probably three or four that I sat down with Richard Fortas and wrote. Oh, nice. uh, yeah. So there's, there's a bunch of shit. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to do 
figure out this whole streaming, download, Spotify, blah, 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 blah. Well, it's interesting. Some artists but will do will do that. You know, they're going to put it out all, all together at once, or they're going to do one song at a time now. And just, no, just no right, there's no wrong, wrong answer yet. No one knows. I, I'm doing one song at a time while I'm working on the record. I mm -hmm. want the record to be like no filler. Like, I don't want anybody to skip over a song. You know what I mean? I do. So I'm, I'm just really working on that, trying to get the best shit I can together. Um, and then I'll put out, I'll do vinyl and CDs. And you know, as well as I do, most people aren't even buying CDs and records and shit anymore. So I'll sell them through Amazon, mm -hmm. my website, and I'll sell them at my shows. That's where you sell most of your records anyway. Even with the yeah. with that massive machine they had behind us, we sold most of our records at our fucking shows. So what's the point? I mean, and that's the thing. I mean, I think I gotta do a lot of records myself. I'm a big record guy. So to me, you know, records is, is the best, you know, especially if you sign them for people. I mean, that's where you get, you can be able to do it on your site. You can sign them and send them out. You know, it gives a little more to the fans. Once again, it's, it's the cottage industry. It's, it's the niche. You control everything. And even though you yep. have, you can have a thousand people, just examples. So instead of having, you know, 10,000 people or a hundred thousand people, you have a thousand people focused, always supporting your art and you can make more money <laughs> than if you have a hundred thousand people half assing it coming in, whatever, if they maybe hear it on some radio or it's now as a podcast or, you know, it's the focus. Yeah. This makes and a that, difference. In this day and age of, like you said earlier in the conversation, podcasts and, you know, I mean, there is no magazines. There mm -hmm. a, a guy like me, um, it, my chances of getting regular airplay on radio stations is slim to none. So, why not just do your own thing and, you know, all these record labels that I've been with for the last, you know, 10 years, really, I was like, for every dollar that I made, I was giving them 50 cents for doing shit that I can do myself. So, I, you know, it's a little more work for me, but fuck it, why not? Well, I, I know there's some bands and, you know, you probably know too, that did no radio this year and they had a platinum album. So, I mean, they skipped radio and they just went right to the internet and the fans and the broke them this time around, you know? So, and, and no, you know, there's one ingredient that nobody talks about in the music industry. And we kind of touched on this earlier when we were talking about Posse Bella. Yeah. And one of the main things is luck. And you can do everything right. You can do the best song you can. You can do the best vocal performance, the best production, you know, get a record label out there that, you know, hires the best PR. And, you know, if there's, if the stars don't align for you, it's not going to happen. Period. And then you look at somebody like, um, like now you were saying, man, God, if Posse Bella, Got into a TV show or a movie. A movie, a summertime movie. That that is the perfect theme song. Like, yeah, or even like a Gilmore Girls. Or, and, and, and I don't know, I've watched. I'm saying any kind of TV show that has a strong audience that enjoys pop music, right? Dig that song. Period. But, but that again, that requires the luck of having some music, some guy that's in control of music for a TV program or a movie. Like scrolling and finding that song and going, this is perfect for this part, for this movie, or whatever. So there is luck. And as as an example, um, is it Kate Bush oh, right yeah. now? Yeah. I mean, the song that she's got right now is like blowing up all over because some dude decided to put it in an episode of Stranger Things. Or Yeah, is it Stranger yeah. Things? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. They put it in Stranger Things, and it's become like a number one single 19 years after she released it. Yeah. I bet you, and I bet you the numbers from Metallica's number are from Master Puppets now. That now that yeah. they have the, they, I bet you that those numbers are probably astronomical, which is good because they probably haven't made a lot of money lately anyhow. <laughs> uh, 
again, it's like there's that's luck. That's got nothing to do with the band. That's somebody finding that song and deciding that that song fits with what they're doing and using that song and it it up into the stratosphere. You know. Well, I'd say that I think part of it sometimes too is the, the, the younger directors coming up and producers doing these things are fans of these artists growing up. And they're like, oh, you know what would be great for that part there? You know? And that they're pulling in artists. I mean, I can't imagine how they're pulling the, like, the music. I don't know if you watch uh, Peaky Blinders. You know? A lot of that... Hmm? I love that show. I'm in season season six right now, so I heard you guys are going to do a movie to, to wrap it all up, so we'll have to wait a few years. But the music, I had to look up the music because I'm like, this is insane. Like, they put a lot of time into it. You know? It's not it's just very, a one off. Yeah, and and it it you know, but again, it's it's that's the luck factor. It is. And until until somebody starts digging through Karabi, you know, it's uh, you know, that's I have to wait. I have to wait. But I think at some point my time will come. I think you're doing pretty good now. I think you're finally out there where people are knowing who you are. You know. And for working. somebody who's not very technical, you're you're pretty much out there in the, in the YouTube world. You're getting pretty well known. So, <laughs> if you got to remember, I'm not putting those videos on the fans. Are I'm just um... talking. You just pressing and play and talking. That's true. Yeah. Well, <laughs> this has been awesome. I'm, I'm gonna put the website underneath like I always do. So people go go to the site, buy the book. Is it better to buy the book through you or Amazon? I don't I don't have them. It's like Amazon, BarnesandNoble.com, Rarebird Lit, um, Rarebird.com. Um, you know, it's, it's slowly, it's slowly building. Um, but it's, uh, it's out there if they want it, it's, it's out there. Uh, I don't have any on my site yet, but, um, you know, the book is out there. I'm on John Karabi.com, John Karabi official on Instagram, John Karabi music on Facebook and grab leg 59 on Twitter. And you're pretty pretty current on them too. I think you even went back as far as when you the car, your your dad's car caught on fire. I think you actually had it up on Instagram. Yes. That was insane. That was bananas. Yeah. It was and and also not only did the car blow up in my backyard, but it was less than twenty four hours after the tornado that went through Nashville. And yeah. So it was it was a very interesting twenty four hours. But it missed you, and you're out of the car. So I wouldn't say you're always in the wrong place at the wrong time. I think you were in the right place at the right time, you know? Yeah, it's all good. It's all good. Whatever. So I want to thank you for being the show, man. It's been great. Thank you, buddy. Thank, thank you, you for that. Thank you. Keep the flag and hopefully, uh, you know, better days are coming for everybody. I'm sure they will. This is awesome. Thank you. Uh, awesome, buddy. Thank you.